Hello and welcome to part two of internal regulation and our continuing series of lectures on physiological psychology uh, with Dr. Paul Merritt. So today we're going to talk about thirst. Uh, thirst is of course an important part of survival. We can, certainly cannot survive without water and maintaining our, the balance of water and uh, electrolytes in our internal environment is critically important to our survival. In fact, as discussed in the last lecture on temperature regulation, one of the major dangers to overheating can oftentimes be loss of salt and uh, hyponatremia. So today we'll be talking about thirst. We'll talk first about thirst satiety, which basically refers to when we know that we've had enough to drink. I'll talk about mechanisms of water regulation and how that works. Talk about two different types of uh, thirst, osmotic pressure and osmotic thirst, and then hypovolemic thirst and sodium-specific hunger. And all of these are uh, mechanisms designed to regulate uh, the amount of water and the amount of salt and electrolytes uh, within our uh, body. So let's start with a brief introduction to thirst satiety. Uh, water constitutes about 70% of the mammalian body, so it's very important that we maintain adequate vo water volume. Water in the body must be regulated within relatively narrow parameters, so we have to maintain a constant amount of water uh, to keep us within that uh, narrow parameter. So we need sufficient fluid in the circulatory system to keep things functioning. We also, of course, need the intracellular environment uh, adequately maintained, so it's a really particularly important part of our homeostatic system. So the concentrations of chemicals in water determines the rate of all chemical reactions in the body. So everything that we have and do, that is how much salt, how many enzymes, all of that is how much it is dissolved in uh, our total water volume. So all of this is precisely regulated. So we're motivated to drink water until we reach what we call the satiety point, or we call that being satiated. This is a really important part of understanding how uh, we go about drinking and also how this process can be disrupted. So for example, uh, people who take the uh, club drug methylene dioxymethamphetamine or ecstasy or molly, uh, one of the known side effects is a disruption in the thirst satiety system. And people will keep drinking water because they think that they're still thirsty. And they keep drinking water and keep drinking water and what happens is they wash out all of the um, electrolytes in their body and they end up with hyponatremia and as a result uh, they end up uh, ha uh, potentially having a heart attack and so it's something you want to be very cautious of because that loss of electrolytes is particularly dangerous. So thirst satiety is an important part of our internal regulation systems. So how does the human body regulate water? Well, uh, human mechanisms of water regulation vary depending on circumstances. Uh, by controlling mostly the input and output of water, either in trying to increase input through thirst or by increasing output by increasing uh, urination. So water can be conserved by two ways, excreting concentrated urine, so uh, retaining water um, and excreting more concentrated urine. This is one of the reasons why uh, service members in the Army, Marine Corps, etc., when they are in very hot climates, uh, such as the desert, are uh, told to essentially keep drinking water uh, so that their urine is constantly clear. They want it to be constantly clear because then they know it's not concentrated because concentration is a sign of potential dehydration. Uh, the reason why you want to make sure it's constantly clear is because you don't want to get to the point where you're decreasing sweat because then decreasing sweat results in uh, increase in body temperature and that's something we obviously want to avoid. Most often, water regulation is accomplished by drinking more water than we need and simply excreting the rest. And so it's always better to have a little bit more water. You don't want to drink way too much water, but uh, to err a little on the side of more uh, water than not is probably the best way to go because then you can just usually just pee out the rest of it um, or sweat it out depending on um, what's happening in your day. So really most often we regulate water by drinking more than we need and just excreting the rest as urine. And one of the things people often think about is if they have high blood pressure or if they've been retaining water that they should drink less water. But the actual opposite is true. If you're retaining water that means you have too much salt. And so if you can get more water in you can then flush out that salt uh, with that extra, extra water and then you won't be retaining water anymore. One of the ways in which both blood pressure and 
uh, fluid retention are maintained is through a hormone called vasopressin. This is released by the posterior pituitary. The vasopressin release, uh, <laughs> raises our blood pressure by constricting our blood vessels, or a process that we call vasoconstriction. Uh, this helps to compensate for decreased water volume by constricting blood vessels, and obviously what it does is it decreases the overall volume of our blood vessels, and as a result, uh, we don't, uh, the volume isn't, isn't as large, and so it decreases for that lo it compensates for that decreased water loss. This is also known as an antidiuretic hormone, or ADH. So what it does is it enables the kidneys to reabsorb water and excrete highly concentrated urine. So when we're retaining water, vasopressin is to blame. So oftentimes certain drugs are tied uh, towards decreasing vasopressin, so thereby making it sort of a diuretic. So several different drugs actually are known to be diuretics, including drugs like caffeine, which um, cause us to release more water, and as a result tend to make us more thirsty. As I mentioned at the start, there are two different kinds of thirst, um, osmotic thirst and uh, hypovolemic thirst. So we'll start by differentiating these two. Osmotic thirst tends to result from eating salty foods. So osmotic thirst occurs from an increase in salt, not a decrease in fluid. So basically we are out of balance and as a result we want uh, more water. Hypovolemic thirst is a thirst resulting from loss of fluids due to bleeding or sweating. So we're motivated to increase our um, volume of water because we have lost fluids uh, due to bleeding or sweating. That's why it's called hypovolemic, meaning too low volume. Um, osmotic thirst is, of course, related to the osmotic processes um, by which um, salt is affected. So we have a fixed concentration of solutes <coughs> in the body as a set point, much like we have other set points. We want to try to maintain that concentration of solutes in the body. So solutes inside and outside of cells create osmotic pressure. So water flows across these semipermeable membranes in our cells from an area of low solute concentration to areas of high solute concentration. This is that kind of concentration gradient we talked about in the very beginning of the semester. We talked about how neurons create neurotransmission. And this occurs across all cells, this kind of uh, solute concentration problem. So what happens is when solutes are more concentrated on one side of the memory membrane than the other, we end up with osmotic pressure. And that osmotic pressure then causes uh, the brain to react and tells us that we're thirsty and we need to drink more water. So when we have this greater concentration of solutes outside the cell than inside, water flows out of the cell, equalizing the solute concentration and shrinking the cell. And it's the shrinking of that cell that actually is the trigger in this part of the brain uh, responsible for that, which was contained in the ventricles. So eating salty food causes sodium ions to spread throughout the blood and extracellular fluid of the cell. That higher concentration of solutes outside of the cell results in osmotic pressure drawing water from the cell to the extracellular fluid. So these certain neurons detect the loss of water and trigger osmotic thirst to help restore the body to its normal state. So when we have consumed too much salt, which pretty much all of us do, uh, because our modern uh, food system has been designed so that we end up with far more salt than we need. Uh, most, particularly processed foods, contain very high volumes or high amounts of sodium. And as a result, we tend to end up having to drink a lot more than we probably would if we had a somewhat more regular diet. And so these, that increase in salt causes neurons to shrink because they've lost water and that then causes uh, osmotic thirst to help to restore the body to its normal state. So the brain detects this osmotic pressure from receptors that surround the third ventricle in what is called the OVLT or the Organum Vasculosum Laminae Terminalis. Uh, I try to remember this because Ovaltine is something that you drink um, and O is related to osmotic pressure. So that helps me remember that it's the OVLT or the Organum Vasculosum Laminae Terminalis and the subfornical organ, or the subfornical organ are all uh, there in the um, third ventricle. They detect osmotic pressure and sodium content of the blood. We also have receptors in the peripheral nervous system, including the stomach and digestive tract, that also help detect uh, the uh, volume of salt uh, and help us determine whether or not, uh, it helps the brain determine whether or not we need to drink more uh, in order to overcome that increase in the amount of salt that we have consumed. 
So these receptors in the OVLT, the subfornical organ, stomach, and elsewhere, relay information to two areas of the hypothalamus, the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus. These two areas then control the rate at which the posterior pituitary releases that hormone vasopressin, uh, which then, of course, tells the um, blood vessels to constrict and the kidneys to release less water. So this is how we end up retaining water when we eat too much salt. This is the process by which that happens. So the receptors in the OVLT, the subfornical organ, stomach, and elsewhere relay that information to the supraoptic nucleus and the paraventricular nucleus in the hypothalamus, which then causes the posterior pituitary to release more vasopressin, which causes our blood vessels to uh, constrict, increasing our blood pressure, which is why salt increases our blood pressure, and also causes the kidneys to hang on to more water. So we end up retaining water that way. So these receptors also relay information to the lateral preoptic area, which controls the motivated part of our drinking, uh, which we've talked about uh, in uh, discussions of the reward pathway. So all of this comes together to get us to drink when we eat too much salty food. So when osmotic thirst is triggered, water that you drink, of course, has to be absorbed through the digestive system. It's delivered by the blood to the brain. That process takes about 15 minutes. The problem with that is you probably drink way too much water in that process. So to inhibit thirst, the body monitors swallowing and detects the distension of the stomach and intestines and says, hey, guess what? You no longer need to drink anymore because you're full. You've had enough water. So we reach that thirst satiety via these processes. Now, of course, if we've eaten so much salt that we still need more water, uh, even after that, wa once that water is processed, we no longer feel full. We may still want to drink more. Need to drink more water to get uh, flush some of that sodium out of our system. Uh, so the one of the take-home messages from this lecture should be really trying to decrease the amount of salt that we intake. As we discussed back in the lectures on taste, uh, when we decrease the amount of salt we intake, we actually change uh, our detection threshold for salt. And as a result, we can actually put less salt in our food and it will still, st uh, still taste just as salty. And so that's a really important way in which we can think about staying healthier by limiting the amount of salt we intake uh, by just simply decreasing the amount of salt. So hypovolemic thirst um, and sodium-specific spe hunger, these occur due to loss of, low, loss of uh, bodily fluid. So thirst associated with low volume of body fluid. So when we have sweat out all of our, all of our um, fluids uh, in a hot summer day out running, that thirst is associated with the loss of, wo of volume of body fluids. So this is triggered by the release of vasopressin and angiotensin, which constrict blood vessels to compensate for that drop in blood pressure. Angiotensin then stimulates neurons in the areas adjoining those third vent ventricle. And neurons in the third ventricles then send axons to the hypothalamus where angiotensin is released as a neurotransmitter. And then this motivates us to um, take in more water. So all of this process has occurred because we have lost bodily fluid. So this is a very different process than the osmotic thirst. One of the other things that can happen is we will have taste preferences that differ based on our thirst type. So if we have osmotic thirst, we really just want pure fresh water. Whereas if you have hypovolemic thirst, you'll have a preference for slightly salty water. This is why sometimes you might crave something like Gatorade if you know that there, if, you, if it's got uh, salt in it. So we might crave that. We also might crave salt, salty foods. So pure water will dilute body fluids and changes our osmotic pressure. But we might get a strong craving for salty foods because we may have low levels of sodium. So when you crave salty foods, that's probably not happening out of the blue. It's because you may actually have low sodium levels. And this is an allostatic response. That is, your body has detected too low levels of sodium and has triggered this kind of response to get you to be motivated to go out and consume the kinds of foods that will help restore this kind of balance. So to give a little comparison of osmotic and hypovolemic thirst, we have two different stimuli for osmotic thirst. We have high solute concentration outside the cells, which causes a loss of water from the cells. Hypovolemic thirst is, of course, triggered by low blood volume. These are best relieved both by drinking water or water-containing solutes. These receptors are contained in different locations, and 
uh, they are associated with two different hormonal influences. So next time we'll pick up on uh, internal regulation and talk about hunger.